Good afternoon bakers, how's it going? This is Nick, you're watching Bake Bread Instead and today we're going to have a go at baking a cottage loaf inspired by this week's Great British Bake Off. It's bread week and one of the tasks that the bakers are facing is creating this sort of classic British bread. We're going to keep it simple, there's a good chance, because I've looked at Paul Hollywood's recipe, he's one of the hosts on the show, that they'll be tasked with using fat in their bread but we're going to keep our bread lean and rather than doing that we're going to cheat with flavor by adding some sourdough starter on top of our instant yeast so instant yeast as normal we've got 750 grams i'm going to use 12 grams of instant yeast just measure that into your lukewarm water it's the instant yeast in this recipe that's going to be doing the rising we're pairing it up with a sourdough starter but we're not going to give it nearly enough time for the sourdough to do its thing Instead, I'm going to add a cold sourdough starter straight out the fridge with the intention of adding some of that flavour without having to wait around for maybe six, seven, eight hours overnight. So we've got our 12 grams yeast. To that, we're going to add 100 grams of sourdough starter. Okay, we're a wee bit over, but I don't think that'll be an issue. The hydration on this loaf is really low. We're only going for around 55%, 60% hydration. And so that little extra bit of flour and water from the starter isn't going to give us an issue. I'm going to mix things up well. And as we've used hot water, it should really get that instant yeast going pretty much right away. We've got 700 grams of strong, plain white bread flour. To this, we are going to add 15 grams of salt. That's about 2% salt to the total, total flour in the recipe. Keeping in mind that we're getting 50 grams of flour added from the sourdough starter that we've just mixed into our water. When you add sourdough starter, you need to remember that you add flour and water to your total measurements. And so you've got to deduct that from what your recipe says. This would be a recipe where we use 365 grams ish of warm water and 750 grams ish of flour but as we're using 100 grams of starter that starter is made at a 50 50 percent ratio we need to take 50 grams of each away from the total i can already see we've got some bubbling going on in our warm water and starter mix nothing left to do now but combine the ingredients and stir as i said we're not really going past 60% hydration on this. So the dough that we should end up with here will be quite firm from the off. That's great because it means we can work on our kneading technique. Doughs of around 60% and lower, I tend to knead on the table. Doughs that are much higher than that, things like ciabatta, they might go up as high as 80, 90%. Or pan cristal, which is a Spanish bread, typically at 100% hydration, where you use the same amount of water as you do flour. They need to be folded, but things here should be quite stiff and workable. I'm not worried about having to fold, but I do want to give it a very good knead. This is free form bread. We're not using a banneton. We're not rising it in anything that is formed. It's going to have to hold its circular shape throughout. Bread naturally wants to spread down and out the way, thanks to gravity. The thing that keeps it in shape is the gluten that adds structure. Those are developed by kneading. So we want a bread here that's going to sit as two large spheres, one on top of the other. And the best way to make sure that that doesn't end up flat is to make sure that it's well kneaded. If you're using a stand mixer, give it longer than you normally would, but don't go crazy. If you're kneading by hand, there's a good chance you pretty much can't overwork this. So got things combined. We know our measurements are right, so we don't really want to add any additional flour to the table. Although, as you'll see, like being a bit of a klutz, I sort of have spilled some out of the bowl. That's fine. We measured that out. It can work its way back into the dough. At this stage, it's like just about coming together. We've not got too much dough, too much flour rather, at the bottom of our bowl. See here, we've got the very floury dough at the bottom. We just pull that in 
and work a little bit to combine everything before I turn it on the table. If I pick that dough up, check it out, there's hardly anything left. What I'm going to do is tip that on the table, put our dough on top of it. A lot of people are worried that when they knead, things are going to stick. But, as you'll see, because this dough doesn't have an awful lot of moisture in it, it's going to be pretty workable. That's a good start. And we can also knead with some things in mind that will help us to make sure that our dough doesn't stick to the table, or rather, as we knead it, releases from the table. One of those things that you've maybe noticed already, but perhaps you've not come across this in your bread making and you're one of these people who just ends up with dough always sticking to the surface is that this bit here, our downside, I am keeping as our downside throughout the kneading. I'm working the dough away, pulling it back, but as I do that, the surface of the dough that's facing down remains facing down. Work opposite sides, just push them out and then fold them back towards the middle. Don't flip your dough. This is building tension that will help it stay in a ball, which is something that we want. And it will also build almost a skin, a tense skin across the bottom as we stretch and stretch and stretch that will not or will resist sticking to the surface below it. If you start working out in all directions, we're flipping the dough. These ragged areas where the gluten hasn't been properly stretched come in contact with the table. And when that happens, things get sticky. So let's just keep it down, work our sides away, bring them back in, turn the dough, work it out. Yeah, I'm working on a, <laughs> working on a cheap IKEA table and you can probably hear it screeching and groaning as we do this. I'd love to say that I had a beautiful granite worktop or some kind of heavy wooden butcher's block, but not everyone does. And we just make do with what we've got. That's what you always hear people talking about when they're working and kneading, is the dough feeling smooth and elastic. That's where we want to get to. We're done. Oh, we just picked up a little bit of dry stuff at the end. Not to worry. Okay. Give it a second. I'm going to go and get a bowl to rise in. Good. Here is said bowl. Now, one thing I would mention that gets overlooked is that we have just spent a bit of time building tension on this surface. Now, we are going to be working this dough again because we need to separate it into two distinct balls. So when we transfer it, we want to transfer it with that tense surface pointing up the way. If this was going to be our final bake, we were letting it proof ready to bake, maybe in a banneton or in some kind of form, we would want to put it in with that tense surface facing down the way. That way, when we turn it out, the tension would be on the top, we'd be able to score the bread on its tensest face, and these little knots that I'm putting in it now would be on the bottom, and as it bakes, they would become the bottom of the loaf. So, as I said, we're going to be working on this again, so it's smooth side up. Let's just build some tension. Great. Just need to cover that with a clean, if somewhat loved, dishcloth. And we'll be back in an hour or so to split it out and shape it up into two round loaves. Check it out. Our dough has had about one hour and 15 minutes to rise and it's looking good. I've already given it a little prod check how it's bouncing back. If you don't already know, an indicator for dough being ready is that you prod, it comes back a little bit, but it never makes it all the way back to the top. Also feels nice and full of air. Shaping it up, let's go. I'm gonna be prepared for the next stage, as you should be. 
We need some kind of board. Doesn't need to be a wooden chopping board, just something big enough for the bottom part of our bread. We also need some parchment paper. And we're gonna turn this out. Here it comes. Ooh. See this? All this texture here, all these little air bubbles, are a good indicator that the dough is fermenting nicely. We now need to get ready to separate our one large ball of dough into one large ball and one smaller ball. I like to make that estimate based on a, a log rather than a sphere. So I'm very gently shaping it up. Something, I don't know, something easier for me to visualize from a halfway point than quarters and thirds. So we know that we need two thirds. Guessing that's about there. So this will be our big ball. This will be our small ball. Just cut through. Let's have a look inside. Yeah, you can just see maybe some of the bubbles. It's not super open, but it is soft and it does have some air. Next step, shaping up two standard bulls. Now, easier to start from a round than a, a square in this situation. So I'm just gonna vary quickly ball these together and pick a side to go down. For me, that's going to be the side that was down to begin with, this side here. Just bring things into a ball without doing too much work, create our rough balls. At this point, we may just need a second or two to relax before we really work on tension. If we were to bake it like this, there's a chance that we would get ruptures and breaks around where the dough is weakest. So we want to just make sure that that is A, right under the middle of our bread. So to do that, I'm pinching and stretching. As we pull this way towards the bottom, we are building up tension on the top. So we want to go right round. We're not pushing down the way, we're pulling round the way. If we were to push down hard, chances are we would knock more air than we wanted out of the dough. Once we've gone round a couple of times, we start pulling the dough towards us. As you pull the dough towards you, turn it and get your hands, scooped hands, underneath. You want to drag towards that middle point. And as you do, you can maybe see we're moving ever closer to a round spherical ball than the sort of oval pancake that we had to begin with. And then underneath, this is our weak point, bang in the middle underneath. It's our small dough ball. We're going to repeat the process for our large dough ball. We're seeing some splitting. This isn't a great sign. It's not the end of the world. Just need to make sure that we move these weaker parts underneath by the time we're finished. Maybe you've noticed we've not added any flour. I haven't needed to. Because we gave the dough a decent bit of work when we were kneading it, because it's not a very wet dough, we don't actually need to add any flour to our work surface or to our dough balls at this stage. They're tacky, but they're not sticky. Flip over and start that same cupping and pulling process. Small rips like this aren't the end of the world. You know, a perfect loaf perhaps that would have none of that. It's an indicator that maybe we could have given this just a little longer in kneading and in proofing. So we pull and build tension, we can move that towards the bottom anyway. One big dough ball and one small dough ball with the weakest point of the dough is directly underneath. That's the hard part done but we need to prepare it to go in the oven. So pick it up, move it out of the way. This little bit of time now, as we fold up our parchment paper, is actually gonna give the dough just a second to relax. And we need that because we're gonna flatten it a touch once it's on its baking sheet. Doing it this way, putting it on something like a chopping board or the back of a baking sheet or any flat surface that you can manipulate the bread on, 
means that as we go to the oven, you can slide it from our cutting board onto an already hot surface. This is a tall bread and we need heat coming from the bottom and the outside of the oven if we're going to get an even bake. So, you know, this is a really old bread. Traditionally, this would have been done in stone or clay ovens where there's a huge amount of heat in the floor of the oven. If you were to put this on a pan directly and then put that pan straight in the oven, the issue would be it would need to build heat underneath before it started cooking the bottom. We're going to heat the pan in the oven and slide this on and we'll skip out that step. It will bake more evenly because it will be baking from all directions. Just give it a minute. It's not quite relaxed enough. I want it to be an oval again. We've built that sphere, we've built the tension. Now I just want to give it the shape that it will take when it's finally ready. It's good enough. Spread out a little, Could maybe be a bit more even. I'm gonna take this loaf, same thing. Let's avoid that hole, just press it out a little. Take it, put it on top of the big loaf. Taking a bit of care to make sure it's centered because once it's on there, it's on there. It's gonna tilt that way a little bit, so let's bring it back around if we can. That looks pretty good. One more step is just to combine these two and let them fuse as the final proof happens. Using something silicon or using flowered fingers, two fingers, we push down through the very middle all the way down to the bottom right down into the chopping board and then we remove their silicon or our fingers leaving a hole that will fuse as the bread proofs because the top layer is now pressed hard into the bottom layer it'll stick together and we'll end up with one cohesive loaf rather than one loaf on top of another you could cover this with a bin liner a large plastic bag you could do a variety of things you could put a dish towel over it all we need to do is stop air getting to it i'm going to do that with a very large pan. Just checking before I begin that the top of the loaf will not reach the top of the pan. It's unlikely because of the way gravity works and the way that loaves want to expand out and down that this will get much higher before it goes in the oven. Its diameter will increase so we need to account for height up to a point and also width of which we've got absolutely loads. That's it. I'm going to come back in 45 minutes. While that's rising, doing its final proof, I'm going to heat up the oven. So, we're nearly ready to bake our cottage loaf, but we're going to up our game a little bit. Something that you won't see on the Bake Off, I suspect, is a glaze in the finish. And that's fine, because we can do better. I think if you have a gut instinct as a baker, there's no harm in trying it. I particularly like a glazed salt crust. I've been doing it on some buns recently. It's very, very savory and delicious. So we've got a tiny splash of cold water. Into that, we're gonna break one egg and we're gonna use that to glaze the bread and add, firstly, a really beautiful dark brown color as it bakes. But secondly, it's an adhesive layer and we can stick on some sea salt, which is gonna make the flavor really pop. Yeah, disaster! Raw egg on surfaces, less than ideal. Particularly as I'll be doing another bake this evening. So we're gonna wipe that down for now and clean it up proper later. That should be our glaze nice and ready. You'll see our loaf has risen somewhat and spread out a little bit. That's to be expected, it's not a problem. And as it bakes, it will spread further out the way, also rise up the way. Take that glaze we just made. I'm using a silicon brush. You could use, you know, any kind of pastry brush to apply this glaze, making sure to get into the cracks. Again, that bread will expand as it bakes. We want to make sure that as much of the surface has glaze on it. We wash with our egg and water wash, then we wash again, then we're gonna score, and we're gonna get the whole thing in the hot oven. Okay, wash one done. 
and just a minute or two after, once we can see that some of the glaze has been soaked into the surface, I'm going to go in with a second layer. Job done. Crack the salt across the whole thing. Take a knife, as sharp as we can get it. I've sharpened this previously. We're going to score in eighths. So, all being well, cut. Cut. <laughs> be confident. This is a fairly dry loaf. It will be forgiving as you work. What you'll see as it bakes now is where we've had the glaze, the colour will darken. Where it rises and pushes up through, it'll be nice and light. Give some cuts to the bottom loaf. And we're there, we're done. Let's transfer it to a hot oven. We're going to give this maybe 30 to 35 minutes, have a check, and then go from there. We'll knock on the bottom, we'll see how the rise has gone. Let's get it in there. There we go. Beautiful little cottage loaf. Yeah, okay. You got a spoon, there's a big spoon.